Hi, everyone, and uh, thank you for staying until the end. We, we left uh, best of last. So we, uh, with me today, I have uh, a great variety of leaders uh, from uh, the payments, uh, processing space, uh, portal space, direct-to-consumer, as well as uh, from uh, auto finance and PPO. Um, I'll introduce uh, Alan first uh, from Babe Maple, uh, and uh, maybe Alan, if you want to say a couple of words about uh, how you fit in the ecosystem, and then we'll go with uh, Jeff and Todd. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alan Cavillas. I'm the CEO of Pay Maple. Uh, I'm, on, I'm on to my fourth payments company. It's, uh, actually, we're, we're not a payments company per se. We're a software platform. We provide SaaS services to uh, ISVs, financial institutions, and other resellers. Uh, we do have a payments component, but we actually lead with uh, cutting edge technology through uh, cloud-based SaaS platforms. Fantastic. Jeff, do you want to go next and maybe talk about uh, how you fit in, in the ecosystem? Sure, happy to. So uh, I'm founder of Highline. Highline is a brand new payments network, which originates uh, consumer payments directly from their payroll platforms. Uh, so particularly for recurring use cases, uh, where someone wants to get paid uh, first out of somebody's income uh, in a way that is uh, extraordinarily seamless uh, and straightforward as we are integrated tightly into the payroll ecosystem. Fantastic. And Todd, do you want to go next? Sure. Thanks, Bob. Uh, my name is Todd Chisholm. I'm the president of Integrated Financial Technologies. Um, we're a lender services business, so a business processing outsourcing uh, component. And what we do is provide um, everything except for the capital, potentially, for a lender who needs to do uh, services to you know customer service, collections, uh, payment processing. So we would use the tools that are for many of the providers here to provide those services to lenders. So we've been, uh, my background is primarily being a lender. So now we, uh, we've got a business that uh, is providing services to those lenders. Great. So I, I want to start with the first question. And I, want to, I know that today quite a few people talk about AI and we hear it in the news, etc. So I want to get from your perspective uh, how that changed your uh, processes, your uh, industry, etc. So Jeff, do you want to maybe uh, share with us uh, how that impacts your business? Uh, sure, I guess uh, kind of like prior trends of going digital and then going to the cloud. Uh, first phase is a whole number of just internal processes that could be done better now that you have a new set of technology. Uh, this is pretty more so right now on kind of the engineering side of things, uh, faster code generation, uh, better testing uh, methodologies, and also in the marketing space, you can just generate much more content, much more UX. Um, I'd expect similar to the prior trends of once a company's fully embraced all these technologies, new business cases, new opportunities uh, will be enabled. Uh, that's probably going to be the more interesting phase, uh, but I don't know if I've seen it yet, uh, but super excited to be watching for it. How about you, Alan? I think artificial intelligence has a place in payments processing. Um, the reason being is that we're mining a lot of data now to basically to offer a glimpse of the actual uh, end user, the, the consumer. And I think you can my, uh, take that data, use artificial intelligence, and serve up new offerings, not just in payments, but beyond payments. And I think that's what you need to do. You have a captive audience, you have to keep hitting them up with other opportunities for more revenue. Fantastic. What about you, Todd? I know that, uh, especially in auto finance, uh, there's a lot of automations with AI. Can you elaborate on some of those use cases? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we've got a, a number of very pragmatic use cases that we have in our business today. If you think about the way a lender operates and we provide all those services to lenders and our relationship with our customers, there's a lot of quality assurance checks is a great example of that where uh, back when I was a lender, uh, you, you know, you'd know you look at 10% of the files, you would evaluate those files, you would come back with an analysis and say these are the error rates, these are the, the circumstances. Now, uh, we use artificial intelligence to basically QA everything and provide reporting out and more detailed reporting. So being able to analyze things like customer sentiment, being able to, to provide our customers who are typically lenders in the space, uh, a full confidence that we are following script, that we're following the brand, that the message is there, and there, that whole trust factor is able to take to a new level using uh, AI and, and the tools that are available. And I only see that increasing from an, uh, you know over time. So basically, uh, if I hear what you're saying, uh, it not only helps with automation, but also helps with compliance and address, and as Alan mentioned earlier, ability to monetize the data, ability to find better patterns and, and uh, optimize uh, uh, other capabilities available for the... For yeah, you can also use that for uh, interchange predictor, for example. You know, have, uh, instead of waiting for a whole month, 
and having uh, everything downgrade, for example, you, you can predict exactly where what your fees will, go, will, will, be, will be, and then you can send that off to your cl clientele as well. So they can correct some of the uh, items on their, you know, maybe there's a broken terminal, maybe a, a user's not using the right thing, they're not using EMV, and they're actually uh, uh, entering card numbers. You can drill down to the user base using artificial intelligence and then uh, provide an opportunity for your organization, your client's organization, to rectify an, uh, a, uh, a bad uh, processing, you know, process. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about uh, microloans as a trend and alternative payments, et cetera? Yeah, um, the, the way payment processing is evolving is that uh, we always uh, prioritize the experience of the actual consumer, right? The, the, the actual payment experience. And so therefore, uh, for example, in our space, in automotive, there's a, there's a use case where somebody goes in, they're expecting to do an oil change, maybe they're paying with a debit card, they don't have a higher credit limit, all of a sudden, now they have to pay five thousand dollars for a whole new set of transmission and and, and a whole new uh, uh, front end. You know, so basically, they're not able to make that decision, and they can't put it on their credit card. They don't have a, the debit card that can support that that repair. But if you can serve them up an instance where they have choices to make, meaning to say, there's lenders out there using uh, through your financial partners they can then uh, get a uh, financing through other sources to pay for that particular repair. And you have to do it almost instantaneously when they refuse a particular repair order. Great. Do you have anything you want to add from a consumer perspective about uh, payments and uh, optimization of, uh, um, of that direct-to-consumer engagement model? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is going to be having those toolkits available, using it when appropriate in an optimized mm -hmm. way just on a routine basis, uh, figuring out what generates the right consumer outcomes. Uh, I mean, generally for merchants, kind of closing deals. Uh, but, you know, if that meaning the consumer's happy with the uh, capabilities that are presented and you're not slamming them with, hey, here's 20 different ways you can maybe get the financing done, uh, but figuring out what are the right uh, options for a particular uh, consumer. What about uh, API configuration versus uh, um, customizations for, for some of your lender partners? How that change speed and how that change the ability to um, change setups, and especially as, as technology change, as, as we saw in the economy, things can, can very quickly change. Uh, is that uh, something which uh, impacts the way you operate, Alan, for example? Oh, well, we like working with partners that embrace open APIs because we have the ability to integrate within your platform, deliver a product quickly and seamlessly, and enhance the, uh, the end user, user experience. Uh, as you had mentioned, you don't want to like um, inundate them with different choices, but basically utilizing open APIs allows you to, to uh, integrate without having to do a lot of heavy lifting. And you can add more products and services without being limited with a fixed um, integration, so to speak. Yeah, if, if both the merchant lender is customizing and the platforms in between are customizing, that's never going to scale for either party. Mm -hmm. It's too much custom work for any given point of sale or uh, scenario. Uh, you need it to scale in order for it to scale. One side, at least, should be using more of an open API approach uh, in order to make it efficient, cost efficient, and an attractive product from that, from that side. What about ID verification? I know that there have been a lot of new solutions and there is a lot of innovation on the ID verification side with digital retailing for the last couple of years. Do you see something which is really different uh, in, in recently? And is there something which is a game changer from your perspective? So do you want to maybe comment on that? Yeah, yeah I, I think from providing services, uh, you know, we do... Uh, uh, we have a partnership for Mecham Financial Services in the collector car space, and we do all of the servicing work and, and work very closely with them for people that want to finance collector cars as they go through that process. And we use, uh, you know, the new tools for ID verification where you're actually taking, showing the driver's license, it's scanning it, it's checking phone numbers to make sure they're real cell phone numbers. And those tools even you know, a few years ago were much more difficult to, to implement. And, you know, some of the comments about open APIs on our platform were able to connect to all the third parties. So when things get better, a, a new solution, a better SMS tool, whatever, now you're able to actually integrate with those partners and move along in the food chain for a better customer experience 
which in past lives, that would have been a much heavier lift for, for the, the lender partner or whomever you were working from the customer standpoint to be able to implement those things. You're talking years, not, not weeks and months. That's great. And I know traditionally all these fraud solutions have created friction, but lately I've seen a lot of solutions which are facilitating that frictionless experience and, and actually at the same time help with uh, fraud protection. I don't know, Alan, uh, is that something which you see as well? Um, I do. Um, as long as you can have the, uh, a quick way to filter out bad actors, then you can enhance actually the, the, the purchasing experience for good actors. And by leveraging technology, there's quite a few that have really good APIs in identifying um, identity. Now they have the ability for biometrics. I mean, it's, 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 it's growing. And it depends on, on each business use case how detailed you want it to be. They're out there. You know, so you can just leverage them, and you don't have to build it. You can, you can just leverage it through, a, through, through integration with their APIs. Okay. I've seen in the last few months uh, mm -hmm. slightly different approach with, uh, based on the market conditions, uh, mm -hmm. with selecting the right partners. Is there something which uh, you've seen on your side uh, as, a, as a difference with respect to due diligence or spending more time deciding who to engage? I know that uh, recently I was at a conference where uh, one of the executives from Chase was talking about how because of the slowdown, they had the time to choose the right partners to work with and uh, to be a little bit more strategic uh, identifying those those partners. So I'm curious, Jeff, from your perspective, have you seen that as well? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm particularly coming uh, from the world of fintech uh, as most of our clients, uh, and that's a uh, been a rough year, particularly from the funding standpoint. A lot of, a lot of fintechs run and depend on that funding. Uh, so there's just a lot more questions in terms of, uh, you know, what, is, what does runway look like? Uh, you know, a little more favorability these days to companies been, that have been around five, ten years and have just a stable book of business. Um, just also a lot of clients that we're working with are making vendor changes, consolidating things, cleaning things up. Uh, much more in a uh, cost efficiency plays uh, and how do I improve my margins uh, in a year like this as opposed to uh, how do I bring a vendor on that'll help me grow, right? That makes sense. So how about uh, in the auto finance space? Can you talk a little bit about marketplaces? And uh, I think that uh, smart sourcing was uh, one of the terminology recently introduced uh, in, in that space. Yeah, it's it's certainly evolved over time. Uh, you know, you, the traditional outsourcing market was all around cost, right? Where, where you could send it offshore, you could do other places where your services and very specific services um, that maybe weren't as strategic as possible for the lowest cost point possible. And where the business has evolved, and certainly our business uh, uh, is emulative of that, is really a smart sourcing approach, which is finding partners, uh, like you were just mentioning, that are more strategic, that you know, you, you know your core competencies, doing more due diligence, uh, someone that can actually do the things they, that you need done, but at a higher quality that you could do even if you're trying to do them yourself. Um, and that's really changed over time. It used to be a, a discussion solely around price, uh, but now it is about partnership. And, you know, the previous panel had talked about, uh, you know, making sure how they treated their customers. Like, that's, that's much more important now than it has ever been because of all the, quite frankly, the failed projects out there where people are, you know, they're struggling to make things work and they need it to work fast and they need it to work efficiently. So, you know, we've seen a real change in the marketplace from, uh, from both a client uh, attitude and our own way we deliver our services. How about you, Alan? Do you see marketplace uh, in your side of the industry? Oh, yeah, definitely. I think the marketplace is one area in our business, at least, and I'm sure different uh, verticals and sectors will will experience an uplift, so to speak. So, you have the ability to, to promote and advertise your solution on, on each particular marketplace, and then, without having to spend a lot of money on advertising, your clients find you as long as you're part of that ecosystem, so to speak, right? So in the case of uh, automotive, automotive dealerships, a lot of these dealerships um, know that they're, uh, that they're use, utilizing uh, CDK Global, for example. That's a, a preeminent pre ERP systems in automotive. There's a marketplace where all the different vendors participate in if you're integrated with, S with uh, CDK Global. We're one of those companies and they find us indirectly. And then they ask questions and then, hey, are you guys integrated? Yes, we are. Hey, and by the way, we do have a payment solution for you. And we have the ability to, to uh, reconcile your statements. And that's basically, I think, what the, where the market's headed. You know, more marketplaces, more ecosystems, and the more marketplaces your organization um, can participate in, the more indirect um, um, referrals come in through your channel partners. 
Can you maybe elaborate a little bit more on the customer satisfaction index and how you use that as a differentiator from? Uh, sure. Um, see, oftentimes when you have an ERP system, a lot of the uh, integrated partners only integrate towards the point of sale towards the end. They're at the mercy of the workflow of that particular ERP system, and there's a lot of constraints. Uh, whereas if you go through and say, hey, we're a, we're a reconciliation engine, we're a, uh, a workflow optimization uh, company, and then lead with that and then advertise that on, on their marketplace, people will then gravitate towards you, and then you can also cross-sell them on payments. What about uh, third-party integrations, uh, Jeff? Uh, how that, uh, from your point of view, do you incorporate other other services as part of the solution? Is there a way to monetize uh, some of those services? I don't know if that's necessarily relevant to you, but I'm sure that to Todd and Alan, that's definitely something which is part of the monetization of uh, their new channels. Uh, yeah, I mean, certainly we work with a, a number of vendors to bring our network to market, uh, particularly in terms of additional monetization. Uh, by being plugged into payroll, into the flow of money, there's a great deal of data that we gain access to as well, uh, which is uh, additionally something to monetize, uh, as well as uh, the attention of the consumer. We do have engagements there uh, where we can help uh, direct consumers to the offers and uh, lenders that uh, they should be working with as they're going to get better deals. Um, so, yeah, certainly a uh, good when you're building a platform to uh, recognize the data you have access to and the opportunities you have to, to leverage that fairly and carefully for everyone in the market. Absolutely. Todd, how about from your perspective, third-party data and integration with some of those services? Yeah, it's, it's really important to be able to have both uh, the most modern tools available and the most accurate tools available. And through third-party integrations is how we work um, in many respects. Having close partners where we all benefit both economically, um, you know, depending on the circumstances, but working with those partners that can deliver services at a high quality level. And what's good for them is good for us. And what's good for the customer is good for both of us uh, in those areas. So we try to have a very synergistic opportunity, even when there isn't a monetary reason to do it. So uh, just making sure that we're aware, maybe conferences like this would be that, you know, what are the, the, the best partners for us to be working with and to provide those services to our lenders? You know, we, we don't want to build everything ourselves. Uh, that's not a path to success, at least not in our industry. It's too complex. But to make sure that we are working with the right partners uh, and then having a beneficial relationship for both is really our end goal. Alan, how about you? Yeah, I do agree with that last statement because, you know, you can't build everything, you know. You either build, buy, or you partner. And uh, oftentimes, somebody else can make it better for you. And then it speeds up your go-to-market uh, strategy. Instead of spending time developing, you can just partner with someone, make the economics work, and then you're, uh, you're out to market. It's quicker, much quicker, and you have a lot more products and services that you can offer your own customer base. So uh, we do like partnering with third party. Do you want to? Maybe um, give an example, a different income uh, Certainly. So, for example, in a payment space and point of sale uh, experience, it's very difficult uh, to offer different payment methods. You have to develop, you have to create the, the rails the, or the connectivity. But if you, have, if you partner with a third party that already has that built, it's that much quicker. A good example would be, hey, a lot of our dealerships wanted to be able to take crypto. Well, all I got to do is partner with a crypto provider and uh, make the APIs work together and then report on the transaction activity, now you have a product that you can resell. That sounds great. Any questions from the audience? Okay, and last remarks. Uh, Todd, do you want to go first? Uh, well, I, I think just, uh, you know, the, the flavor of obviously this panel is, is working with third parties and being able to provide uh, ancillary service, whatever part of the ecosystem that you, you work in. But um, the using AI in a way with a legitimate use case is something that uh, that we're really focused on. There's a lot of talk in the industry. We, we actually were using some AI before it was cool. Um, so, you know, talking about that more, some pragmatic use cases and expanding the industry, I think, is, is something that we're really working hard towards and certainly appreciate the time on the panel and uh, at the conference. It's been great. Alan, do you want to go next? Absolutely. Um, I think one has to look at the customer's uh, experience and, and, and if you can make your mer merchant's customer the, cent the center of the universe and make it easier for them to transact and give them the power to make decisions to make payments, I think you'll see an enhancement 
um, with your uh, retention. I think that's the key to payment processing in the future. Jeff? Sure. I mean, it, any given company can only be kind of great at one, maybe two things. Yeah. Uh, but a full product, a full customer experience, and then needs a whole array of services. Yeah. Uh, so to actually deliver a great customer experience, you need to identify the best in class providers uh, across the board uh, and integrate that cleanly. Um, and then as the company, do what you do best, uh, which is probably not payments or any of the other aspects. It's probably more sales or customer service or whatever your distribution is. Uh, so uh, yeah, definitely identify the right partners for you uh, and make sure you put it together in a, in a good package for your customer. That's great. Well, thanks everyone, thanks for your time. And uh, if you have any questions for any of the panelists, feel free to reach out to them after the, after the session.